Uh, as I introduce myself, I'm Dheeraj. I'm one of the uh, intensive care consultants. I work at Tarrant Valley Hospital UK. Uh, the photograph is that of my hospital. That's the you know, typical introduction, boring introduction everyone gives. <laughs> I usually like to have my sessions very interactive, but uh, I think Zoom has changed quite a lot of things. COVID has changed a lot of things. I used to look at people and talk. Nowadays, I look at a lapse laptop and a screen and a laptop and talk. Yeah. I just want to confirm that everyone can hear me and everyone can see me. If you can't, please just message on Zoom that you can't see or can't hear. And I'm sure Shiv can uh, sort can it out it from his end. Yeah. All right. So well, this topic is a very boss topic and I'm not going to make uh, any assumptions that I can cover this whole topic in this 45 minute, you know, 40 to 45 minute presentation. It's almost going to be impossible. I am going to give you a brief overview of what you would need to go into your exams or just to, you know, for your day to day practice as a, a, a trainee in anesthesia or as a consultant when you go and see a patient and you think about shock, uh, what are the minimalistic things which you can do? Okay. So, sorry. So, you, if you look at the books, there are so many different uh, definitions for shock. And uh, every time you look at a new paper, you will come uh, up with a very new definition. I've had a look at a few definitions myself. And I think that I like this definition the best. Because if you break this definition into a few parts, that tells you basically what shock is. Okay, so the first part here, which says that shock is a syndrome. Yeah, it is just not a single condition. It's a syndrome. It's characterized by decreased perfusion of tissue. Okay, which ultimately leads to decreased supply of oxygen and nutrients to the cell. And it is associated with hemodynamic instability, ultimately leading to cellular dysfunction, organ failure and death. The thing is that when a patient presents to you, he can present anywhere in the syndrome. So it could be just the beginning where the perfusion of tissues uh, is a problem, or he could present to you with multi-organ failure. One thing about shock we know is that the earlier you institute uh, the therapy, the better the outcome. And this whole thing is to trying to recognize which phase of shock you get a patient in. So it's very important to understand the pathophysiology of shock and a pathophysiology of shock follows in this order, okay? It always starts with an imbalance in oxygen demand versus supply. It moves to conversion of aerobic to anaerobic metabolism. This is accompanied with worsening of your acidosis and hyperlactemia. All the normal compensatory mechanisms which exist uh, in your body suddenly get disrupted. This ultimately leads to cellular death and dysfunction. And, and leading to multi-organ failure and death. Now I'm gonna talk about each of this uh, uh, in detail a little bit, okay? So we come first to imbalance in oxygen demand versus supply. Now this is a very tricky thing because, you know, you might find that some people have enough oxygen but have a supply problem. And in some people, the amount of oxygen which they have used is so much that they've exhausted their supply. So even though, you know, they can actually deliver oxygen, they don't have enough oxygen in the system. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with this formula. This is the formula for oxygen delivery, which actually is very simply your cardiac output times the content of oxygen in your blood. The oxygen content is calculated by the formula 1.34, which is the oxygen carrying capacity of uh, each gram of hemoglobin and then depends on the total amount of hemoglobin which you have and your saturation. Now from this formula, you can directly see that if there is any factor which is gonna affect your cardiac output or your hemoglobin or your oxygen saturation, you're gonna have a problem with oxygen delivery. For example, at present, when we are seeing a lot of COVID patients, uh, I mean, our personal experience have been that we've seen a lot of patients who have got saturations which are in their 90 and 92s, but at the same time, they're having PO2s as low as six. So the oxygen distribution curve in these patients is shifted quite a bit to the left. It means the oxygen is quite bound to the hemoglobin and is not releasing. So, I mean, there are various theories being touted about why this happens. Uh, we really don't know why it is. But looking at this, you can immediately see that if there is a fall in your hemoglobin or saturation because of any reason, you're going to have a problem with the delivery of oxygen. At the same time, any problem with your cardiac output is also going to affect your oxygen delivery. 
Now we know that your cardiac output is your stroke volume times your heart rate and your stroke volume depends on three things it depends on your preload it depends on your contractility and it depends on your afterload now what do i mean by preload what i mean by preload is how much your atria or your ventricle is filled before the ejection takes place now all of us know that heart is a muscular pump it is guided by the starling's principle so if you look at starling's law it says that you know the force of contraction is directly proportional to the initial length of the muscle fiber now in the heart the only way you can stretch the muscle fiber is by expanding the ventricle okay is by volume and that is why when you actually look at the starling's curve when it comes to the heart the baseline the, the x axis is always volume because it is the volume which actually stretches the initial length of the muscle fiber so if you stretch it you get a much higher force of contraction but you can't get the same amount of contraction in every patient there are reasons where contractility of the heart is affected this could be because of a dead area of the tissue because of an mi it could be because of an aneurysm or it could be plainly due to myocarditis or cardiomyopathy the afterload to the heart or to the stroke volume is also quite important it's just because if you are trying to pump against a very high resistance then the amount of fluid which can be ejected out of your heart is restricted we'll go about we will go about this in a little more detail as, as the talk goes on okay now we talked about that oxygen delivery can be reduced by reduction in hemoglobin so this might commonly happen in patients who have got you know severe hemorrhage they're just bleeding they have been involved in uh, trauma or patients having severe anemia due to any reason and we all know that anemia has its own compensatory mechanisms you find that patients who are anemic normally generally tend to be hyperdynamic in circulation normally the oxygen dissociation curve in these patients would be shifted to the right to facilitate the release of oxygen okay decreased saturation of oxygen this occurs due to respiratory failure a any cause for which you can't get enough oxygen in or there is a problem of the oxygen dissipating from the lung into the blood you know any any problems like you know pulmonary fibrosis interstitial lung disease or anything of that sort at the same time i mean the, what you see is cassava here i mean it's a popular uh, kind of vegetable had in this african subcontinent but the problem with this is that if you consume a lot of that you get cyanide poisoning and things like cyanide or carbon monoxide poisoning what they cause is they have an increased amount of affinity with the oxygen and they don't release the oxygen at all so you might have the hemoglobin molecule which reaches its target organ you go there but still the oxygen is not relieved uh, not released and that's why you get what is called as histotoxic hypoxia coming to the next part it's just conversion of aerobic to anaerobic metabolism worsening acidosis and hyperlactemia and disruptive uh, disruption of the compensatory mechanism why does this happen okay so this happens basically because of the reduction of atp availability now atp is a funny thing yeah i i normally remember one of my friends always used to say that this is the full loose of the body yeah atp is the cash of the body you go to any organ you go to any process you got atps you spend atps it functions properly if you don't have atps it's not like having enough notes in your pocket so you have to find alternate methods of doing stuff yeah you have to go to you know try doing shortcuts and stuff like that and this is exactly what happens when you don't have oxygen when you don't have oxygen the normal aerobic ac activity which takes or aerobic metabolism which takes place which generates close to around 36 molecules of atps cannot take place okay you can generate only two molecules of atps but at the same time you have to you know he says i'll give you money but you tag my friend along and this friend is lactate okay so you get an overproduction of lactate what happens because of this lactate the lactate is an acid because of this you get worsening of uh, acidosis okay so any patient who's got lack of oxygen has anaerobic metabolism you do a blood gas we'll see that he becomes his base excess is actually starting to go high in negativity and his lactate starts building and this is actually a very good sign of poor perfusion because you know that this patient is not perfused properly and what does that cause now if you look at theologically speaking you think all this is done maybe there is a benefit 
Okay, if you're developing acidosis, that means your oxygen distribution curve is shifted to the right. And if it gets shifted to the right, that means it's gonna release more oxygen to the tissue. Maybe, but we always know that there is a law of unintended consequence here. If you do something, hoping that this is gonna be the consequence, you gotta have some kind of unintended consequence which occurs later on. Now what happens here is that when you actually acidotate and you're looking for your blood to, you know, you're looking for your organs to be perfused uh, better, your blood pressure is dropping, you want your blood pressure to go high, that's why your body is having a catecholamine storm, your catecholamine responsiveness decreases massively when there is acidosis, okay? And as I said, once once that happens, I mean, your oxygen starts, uh, you know, hemoglobin starts having decreased affinity to oxygen and starts releasing all the oxygen here. This is followed by cellular dysfunction and death. And this part, now we are going from where we could do something to the patient to a part where, you know, irreversible kind of shock is starting to set in. So once you have decreased ATP availability, Okay, your cell membrane ion pumps say, I'm not gonna work anymore, okay? Okay, so the normal function where your cell is gonna get rid of the sodium uh, does not happen. So it starts retaining sodium because it doesn't have a channel. It doesn't have a pump which can get the sodium out. When this happens, one of the unintended consequence of having a lot of sodium in your cell is that it attracts water, okay? Water starts moving into your cell and water doesn't require a channel. You know, water is freely permeable. It can go anywhere at once. This leads to cellular edema. Once your cell starts getting edematous, it starts sending signals saying that, you know, I am dying, there's something wrong. And this leads to your normal inflammatory response and the release of your lysosomal enzyme. Ultimately, what these enzymes do is they attack the cell itself and causes cellular dysfunction and ultimately cellular death follows, okay? This, we move on to, you know, one of the worst phases of uh, shock where organ failure ensues and your organ failure occurs because of decreased perfusion. Now, what happens because of your decreased perfusion is that your capillary permeability starts increasing. That means all the water which is there in your blood vessel starts moving out. Now, what happens because of that? there is sludging of the microcirculation because it doesn't have enough water for the circulation to take place. Once this happens, this further prevents perfusion of the organ, okay? At the same time, there are compensatory mechanisms like intense vasoconstriction, which takes place. And you know, there's the, the body tries to think, oh, it's the pressure we require. Whereas at this point, it is flow which is required and your flow to the organ is probably impeded by the sludging of the microcirculation and vasoconstriction also inhibits flow. All this ultimately leads to organ failure, which is the final consequence of what happens in shock. So this was briefly what was the pathophysiology of shock. I'm, I'm going to briefly touch on what the stages of shock are. You know, it's there are three stages. There's nothing much to talk about. It, it just means that you have a compensated phase where your body is compensating for whatever takes place. Then is the decompensated phase where all the compensatory mechanisms which is happening are failing. It goes to the final phase, which is irreversible or refractory shock. When you are in this stage, you can try your best, but I, I don't think so you will be very much, uh, you know, it, it's possible to salvage that organ. You might still be able to salvage the life, but the organ's already gone. For example, you might have a patient who might have acute tubular necrosis occurring because of irreversible because of irreversible shock and perfusion to the kidneys. You might end up with a patient who might survive with a very small chance, but might end up having renal failure. The kidneys are gone and he might have to have dialysis all his life, okay? So these are just uh, the, the stages of shock. Now, in compensated shock, what is the initial compensation which takes place? You have increase in your oxygen delivery by increasing your cardiac output because we know heart rate increases, so you get tachycardia. You get tachypneic, your body thinks, yes, you know, acidosis is one of the trigger for increasing your respirate, okay, along with hypoxia. Although hypercarbia is probably the most potent uh, stimulator of the respiratory center, but acidosis as well as hy uh, hypoxia can also play a part in that. Your body tries to conserve water, so you get decreased urine output, okay? 
your body tries to increase your SPR, okay? Because that's another way it can compensate. So you get pale clammy skin, okay? You get a fast and thready pulse, increased capillary refill time. Although in one of the kinds of shock, which is like distributive shock, you might see that the patient present with hyperdynamic circulation and bone peripheries. Now this is because the pathology of this shock is more vasodilatation as compared to vasoconstriction. And that occurs because of toxins present in your body or neurogenic reasons. We'll come to that. Now how does shock progress, okay? Till now, you saw that the blood pressure was okay. Now you start noticing that your blood pressure starts dropping. You get severe hypertension. It's associated with oliguria and anuria, okay? Severe acidosis ensues. Your ECG is all over the place. You're starting to get all kinds of dysarrhythmias and bradyarrhythmias, okay? You get hypercarpia. Your pH starts to come down. You start becoming more and more acidotic. Your brain gets affected. You get altered sensorium and coma. So how do you diagnose shock? I mean, it's, it's very, you know, it's, it's what we do in our day-to-day -day practice. Have a thorough history, examine the patients, look at the vital signs, look at if there are any signs which gives you a indication that there might be a cause of shock, okay? Like pallor, which tells you that patient might be bleeding somewhere, okay? Edema, which tells you maybe this patient has cardiac failure. Sinosis, which might tell you that there's not enough oxygen, uh, you know, going into the circulation probably jaundice or any of the associated causes of uh, jaundice or, or if your patients, for example, in hepatorenal syndrome or things like that. And any exam, uh, for example, in the UK, we are asked a certain question when it comes to OSCE or uh, writing a SAQ. It's always good to have a very systematic approach. We normally say that you need to classify or die, approach it with a clear system. So as with everything, we follow the ABCD approach here. So check for the patency of the airway. Make sure the airway of the patient is fine. Look at the breathing. I mean, one of the things which people don't normally look at, and I find even my junior doctors nowadays, you know, if there's someone with a respiratory rate of 40, they just say, oh, the patient has a respiratory rate of 35 or 40. But is it useful? Of course it is. How does your body compensate for all the acidosis which occurs in the body? The only way it can compensate is by increasing the respiratory rate because when it increases the respiratory rate, you wash out the CO2. So when you see someone who is hyperventilating in front of you, it might, there might be several other reasons. There could be reasons like you know, pain, for example. There could be uh, you know, reasons like he might have hypoxia due to any causes. But acidosis and a response to acidosis is hyperventilation. And, and it should alert you that there's something wrong going on. The rhythm of respiration, why well, you call certain rhythms which are stated with acidosis, like kind stroke breathing. The depth of respiration. For example, if you see someone, the breathing is very shallow, or it's just one side which moves. That's why the equality is important. If one side is moving more than the other, you could suspect that this patient has a pneumothorax. And use of axillary muscles of respiration. I mean, it's a very good indication. It is an indication that the patient is tiring. Patient might have a really bad pathology going on in his chest. So just by looking at the breathing of a patient, it can give you so much information just at the bedside that you can almost come to some kind of reasoning on what's going on with the patient. And of course, as with everything in breathing, always check for the oxygen saturation, check for tracheal position, make sure there's no pneumothorax. Always good to check for some crepitus too. It can occur in, in cases where you get massive pneumothorax that you could get a little bit of crepitus. At this point of time, you know, uh, I, it's very important to mention that our personal um, experience of looking at quite a lot of COVID patients was that we found quite a significant number of these patients had pneumothorax, not exactly pneumothorax, they had pneumomediastinum and quite a few patients started developing subcutaneous emphysema. And one of the reasons is that probably, as you all know by now, that it's not primarily a disease of the lung. So we were trying to ventilate these patients higher, you know, give them excess of PEEP and probably that was leading to all these problems. So my point here is that if, even things like crepitus can give you information of what's going on with the patient. Circulation, I mean, in shock, it's always very important because as we discussed before, uh, everything depends on whether your oxygen can be delivered to your tissue or not. Simple things like the color of your skin, you know, is your patient sinus? 
you know, is he pink? Is he pale? Is he mottled? Stage of the peripheral veins, you know, are they underfelt, collapsed, or hypovolemic? Even the state of your veins in your neck is important. It is very important to actually look at the JVP. It gives you, it's a very simple examination. It's done on the bedside. If you have someone who's hypertensive and you can see the veins up to the ears, you know, this patient's overfelt. You should not be giving fluid. Probably has got to do with the cardiac pathology. But at the same time, if you see that someone has a very low blood pressure, but has a JVP which can't be seen at all, you can give as many fluid boluses as you want because you could be safe that this patient is not in cardiac failure. Or even if he is, the problem is hypovolemic at present. Yeah? Signs of poor cardiac output. Yeah, reduced level of consciousness. Is the organs perfused well? Is the patient having oliguria? Okay, normally, you know, 0.5 mLs per kg per hour is, is taken as a standard uh, everywhere. And at the same time, look for signs of, you know, blood or bodily fluids. If the patient's had extensive diarrhea, vomiting, has just vomited coffee ground, you know, aspirate, or if the patient's bleeding, all this gives you an idea into what's going on with the patient, you know, whether the patient could be hypovolemic. It's always important to feel the temperature of the skin. One of a routine practice as an intensivist, and I'm sure all my intensivist friends around here do, is, is feel the peripheries of the patient. If it's cold, clammy, or it's warm, it gives you quite a lot of information. All you have to do is, you know, touch the patient and feel what's going on there. Look for the capillary refill time. What the capillary refill time tells you is that the patient has a very high SVR. Look for a peripheral pulse. If you can't even feel a peripheral pulse or you feel a peripheral pulse on one hand and don't feel the peripheral pulse on the other, well, is there something going on with the aorta? You know, things like that. Very simple examination, bedside examination can tell you a lot about the patient. Of course, there are complicated things like a third heart sound, which believe me is not very easy to hear, but uh, a murmur might indicate a valvular disease. Patient was absolutely normal, suddenly has had endocarditis ruptured, has having a regurgitation, you know, things like that. And a pericardial ra. I mean, to be very honest, I've never heard that all my life. I, I'm not sure if anyone else has, but uh, that may help too. Measure the blood pressure, measure the pulse pressure. If you have a pulse pressure which is very narrow, you know this patient's probably dry. If the pulse pressure is very wide, you know this patient's vasodilated. So a narrow pulse pressure indicates vasoconstriction, a wide pulse pressure indicates vasodilatation. Of course, you know, in certain patho sorry, uh, in, in certain pathologies uh, like valvular heart disease, you might find that the pulse pressure varies. For example, in aortic regurgitation, you have a very wide pulse pressure. In stenosis, you have you know narrow pulse pressure. Measure the urine output. Early urine outputs are very important in understanding what's happening with your patient. Probably a caveat here is that a normal blood pressure does not always indicate the adequacy of perfusion because the initial stages of shock, in a compensated shock, your patient might have a normal blood pressure, but at the same time might be having hyperperfusion of his organs. Yeah? Common investigations to be done, they're all listed there. Uh, you know, your routine bloods, a blood gas. The amount of time I find people sending, you know, a lot of routine bloods, but not doing a blood gas, uh, it's astonishing. You don't have to do an arterial blood gas. You can do what is called as a venous blood gas. And I think it's a standard practice. When I was training to be an uh, intensive care consultant, I was doing a medical job at that time. One of the things which we always used to do when we collect all the bloods, from the vein, just collect it in a blood gas syringe, send it for a blood gas. You'll know what the base excess is. You'll know what the lactate is. You'll know what the electrolytes are. It's a very simple investigation, which is at bedside, which will give you quite a lot of information. Of course, you could do imagings like CT scans or x-rays. That'll give you a little more information of what's going uh, uh, with your patient. Point of care ultrasound, well, I can't stress enough how important it is. I, I do understand it's not available in all the parts of the world. Uh, we are very lucky here in the UK that we do have point of care ultrasound and I, it has changed my management in so many patients by just going next to the patient, doing a focused echo or just doing a, a, a thoracic scan, you know, scanning the lungs gives you such a lot of information. I, I think things like focus is gonna be a bedside tool in the next 10 years cardiac troponins, and of course, special cells like mast cell tryptase and cortisol if you're you know, suspecting a special, uh, specific kind of shock.
Now to understand shock, this one formula can give you whatever you need to understand in, in terms of hypertension, which occurs along with shock. So if you are having a shock patient who has gone into the second phase where the blood pressure has dropped, how do you understand what to do with this patient? I, I always love thinking about this formula. So this formula is your mean arterial pressure is equal to your cardiac output times your SVR. Now we know your cardiac output is your stroke volume times heart rate, okay? Now this is a linear equation, which means that anything which will cause a decrease in your cardiac output will cause a decrease in your arterial pressure. And at the same time, anything which can cause a decrease in your SVR will also cause a decrease in your mean arterial pressure. But is it possible to compensate the fall of your car cardiac output with an increase in your SVR? Yes, so if your cardiac output goes down and I increase the SVR, your map might still remain the same. And this is what happens in the compensatory phases. That's why that increased SVR, okay, can cause people to be cold peripheries, increase in capillary refill time. And at the same time, we know cardiac output is your stroke volume times your heart rate. So your heart rate also increases as a compensatory mechanism. So that's why in any shock patient, you will normally see that the heart rate is high. They are very tachycardic and the SVR is high. And this, I mean, in things like hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock, where the etiology is primarily a loss of SVR like distributive shock, which is like your septic shock or your neurogenic shock, you will probably not find cold clammy extremity. But it's very important, that's why to examine the extremity, to touch it, to find out what it is. A stroke volume depends on three things, as I told you before, but it also depends on LV compliance. So what I mean by that is that your stroke volume depends on your preload, which is how much your ventricle is filled in. It depends on your contractility, which is how hard your ventricle can contract. And what is very important is sometimes you find that the patients are in cardiac failure. You can see them, you see that they are in cardiac failure. You do an echo and you find that their systolic function is fine. Now this is what we call as preserved systolic function uh, heart failure, or probably a diastolic heart failure. So in these patients, they have diastolic dysfunction basically because the LV compliance is not good. What happens because of that? So if your LV compliance is not good, your LV doesn't fill, so it doesn't expand. If it doesn't expand, it doesn't contract very hard. So nowadays, there's an increased awareness that LV compliance and diastolic dysfunction is also a major cause of decrease in your stroke volume. I incidentally treated a patient, I think, uh, maybe six months ago, where we were looking at all the causes. We, it was just baffling us. And then we did an echo and we found that the patient was having severe diastolic dysfunction. And as we started treating her for that, her condition improved. So it's good to think about preload and contractility. But when you think about stroke volume, always, always please keep in your mind that LV compliance also does play a part. Now, if you look at this, this is what we call as your Starling's curve. Yeah. So you've got your LVEDP, which is your left ventricular and diastolic volume on your x-axis, and you've got your stroke volume on your y-axis. As I told you, in Starling's law, we, no, it, it, sorry, this, this is actually using pressure, uh, but you can use volume for the same thing. And if you use your le left ventricular and diastolic volume, you'll find that as the volume increases, your stroke volume also increases, okay? So this part of the curve is where you can actually improve your stroke volume by giving extra fluid, okay? Once it reaches this part, then even if you give more fluid, it's not gonna help much. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, uh, this part of the uh, Frank Stalin curve. And what are the types of shock? So you can broadly classify it as hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock, and distributive shock, okay? In cardiogenic shock, you've got two types of shocks. You've got cardiogenic shock which occurs because of pump failure, that means there's an obvious failure of your pump to contract. A second thing is what we call as obstructive shock. In an obstructive shock, there are two kinds of shock. They're called as intracardiac shock or extra, it means intracardiac obstruction or extracardiac obstructions. You also have what is called as distributive shock where your SVR goes down. So you get things like septic shock, anaphylactic shock, and neurogenic shock, which falls in this category. Hypovolemic shock, very simple preload goes down, okay? Loss of fluid, pump is half empty. If your pump is half empty, you contract, you're not gonna get enough ejection, your stroke volume decreases, that's why your blood pressure falls. 
it occurs in patients where you have fluid losses due to any reasons, commonly uh, like bleeding, GI losses, or renal losses. What I mean by renal losses is if you get a patient who comes into you with initial renal failure and then you start treating him and then he goes into a polyuric phase, these guys just can have urine output losses of around 300 to 400 mLs per hour and they can become negative very fast. Third space losses or increase in your venous capacitance. What it means is that if you're vasodilated someone suddenly, the venous capacity increase, capacitance increases and your patient can get hypovolemia. But though this is very relative. So if you actually increase the, uh, 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 the if you vasoconstrict these patients, why well, your patient become better fast. Recognition may be difficult. And as I said, there is a decrease in preload. But to compensate this decrease in preload, there's usually a compensatory increase in your SVR. So you find these patients are cold, clammy extremities and, and have an increase in their capillary field time. So how do you evaluate it? So there are two methods of evaluation, what we call as the static evaluation methods and your dynamic evaluation methods. So your static evaluation methods are things like tachycardia, decreased uh, capillary refill tank, you know, hypertension, hyperlactemia, Okay, signs of decreased renal perfusion like oliguria, low urinary sodium, okay, metabolic acidosis, or of course, just look at the patient. Patient will say he's thirsty. It is a very interesting thing as the amount of patients who say they are thirsty, if they have an intact functioning hypothalamic system that, you know, even in, I see patients on my intensive care, I do around and I'm not sure whether they require fluid or not. And I ask them, are you thirsty? And they say, yes, I am very thirsty. It can give you a lot of information. Okay. Dry mucous membranes, increased skin turgor, all those are signs of dehydration and will uh, lead to the diagnosis of hypovolemia. But the problem with static evaluation is that they've got very limited sensitivity and specificity. And this has led to an adoption of what we call as dynamic evaluation. What are the normal features of dynamic evaluation or how, do, how we can do that? One of the easiest things of assessing whether someone is hypovolemic is orthostatic hypertension. Okay, get their blood pressure in the sitting position, get them lying and see if there's any difference in that. Get them standing or get them lying and see if there's any difference in that. Of course, there are other reasons uh, like, you know, people who are having autonomic dysfunction who might have orthostatic hypertension. But generally, if you are having a patient who's having hypertension and you're worried whether they have got uh, hypovolemia, this could be a method of detecting that. Variations in your CVP, okay? The respiratory variations in your arterial pressure and stroke volume, your pulse counter analysis, this is by looking at what we call a systolic volume variation. But you've got to be aware that this works only in mechanically ventilated patients. And even ideally, they say all the studies which have been done have been done in patients who were ventilated with eight mLs per kg body weight. Passive leg raising. I can't tell you how important this is. If you see a patient in the ward just and he's hypertensive, just lift their legs for a few seconds, yeah, 15 seconds or so. Repeat the blood pressure. If the blood pressure improves, you know that the patient's hypovolemic because what you have effectively done is given two transfusions of 500 ml of blood from both the legs, yeah? So 500 ml from each leg, so a liter. And then if that improves your blood pressure, that means your patient is depleted of fluids. It's, it's a very easy way of detecting hypovolemia at bedside. You could always give a fluid challenge. And of course, there are the cardiac output monitorings. There are the PICOs, the LITCOs, and you know, pulmonary atrial catheters. So using thermodilution techniques or pulse counter analysis, if you have any of these fancy gadgets, you can put it on and it'll tell you whether your patient's hypovolemic or not. Now, fluid challenge is, is a very common thing which we expect most of our junior doctors to do. So if you actually have a patient who is hypovolemic on the ward, you know, always, always try a fluid challenge, okay? Now the the only problem with the fluid challenge is what we're trying to find out here is that whether a shock patient will increase his stroke volume in response to a fluid bolus. That's the purpose of doing this. But even if you have a patient who is fluid responsive, that means if he responds to a fluid challenge, it doesn't always mean that he requires fluid, if you know what I mean. So if you actually have a patient who's hypertensive, you give fluids, the blood pressure comes back, absolutely fantastic. Your patient's hypovolemic. But always be cautious that if this patient's normal blood pressure is 90 systolic and you give fluid, the patient might respond to fluid. It might become better to like 100 or 110 systolic. 
but it doesn't mean that the patient required fluid in the first place. That is why it ha you have to assess whether that patient is in shock. You know, many of our patients have a systolic blood pressure of 90 to 100 normally. That doesn't mean that they're in shock or hypovolemia. That's why it's very important to look at the other signs, like is their basics is fine, is their lactate fine, before you establish the diagnosis of shock. Now, there are certain common misconceptions about uh, fluid challenge here. Yeah? It should not just be held because the CVP is high, because the CVP could be high due to many reasons. I mean, you could have someone who's got severe tricuspid regurgitation and you can have the JVP very high. So that does not necessarily mean that your patient's well failed. Okay. Now, I, you know, people keep asking, I'm, I'm sure that I read somewhere, even in this forum, I think a couple of days ago, where people were saying, oh, is it safe to give fluids in someone with pulmonary edema? And what happens in pulmonary edema is that quite a lot of fluid because of the pressure in the blood vessels go out of the blood vessels into the lungs. So there is a loss of fluid. So there are some patients who have pulmonary edema and are hypertensive, but can be dry. You could give them a 100 to 200 bolus of fluid and see how they respond. You just have to be more judicious, okay? And the third common misconception is that if you have a patient who's in positive balance or your patient does not require fluids, you might see a lot of patients with conditions like uh, maybe pancreatitis, they require loads of fluid. They go in the first two days when they have raging inflammatory process going on. Uh, it's not surprising. Sometimes we end up giving them close to five to 10 liters of fluid. It's not very uncommon. So just because they are three or four liters positive, you start thinking, oh, should I give them any more fluids? Yes, yes, sometimes you do have to. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to withhold fluid because your patient's in a positive balance. Now, fluid challenge, how do you do that? Well, crystalloid versus colloid, this debate goes on and on. Personally, in the UK, we do not use colloids at all. After the SIXIS trial came out, which showed that starches are associated with a high uh, number of renal failure, we stopped doing it. At the same time, uh, there were studies which were showing that gelatins also could be attributed in causing renal failure, things like gelifusin and stuff like that. Okay, normal saline also can cause uh, uh, renal failure. There's nothing normal about normal saline. It's not a physiological solution. Ideally, use the balanced electrolyte solution. We are very lucky to have something called as plasmolite, but Hartman's also does the job very effectively. Now, some people might say that there are studies which quote that it, it doesn't make a difference. You know, colloid are not associated with much risk as, associated, as compared to crystalloids. I agree with that. There are some studies which show the opposite. There was a Cochrane review which was done, which compared crystallized with colloids. And they found that there was no difference in terms of plasma expansion between crystalloids or colloids. Oh, of course, you needed to use crystalloids slightly more, roughly to the tune of around 1.5 to 1.8 times than what you'd use colloids. But it did not have any difference in any other parameters or, or any other adverse effect. So you would question me that, yeah, in which case, what is the harm in using colloid? Well, there's no harm, but there's no benefit. And colloids are much more expensive than crystalloids. And there are some kinds of colloids which have been shown to do harm. I'm, I'm sorry to say, but you could have renal failure. You could have an anaphylactic reaction. And it takes an awful lot for those large molecules to leave your system. Okay. So if you ask me, I would always err on the side of a crystalloid. So I would always give a 250 to 500 ml bolus of a crystalloid. Okay, I titrate that to a response. You titrate it against signs of underperfusion. You titrate it to the CVP. Ideally, you should monitor stroke volume, you know, have a cardiac output monitor. Or, and without monitoring, I think giving up to two fluid, fluid challenges is okay. When you start to give more than two fluid challenges, you have to start worrying about, you know, things like the fluid going into the lungs and stuff like that. So how do you treat hypovolemia? Pretty much simple. Your fluid, your depleted, give some fluids, okay? So oxygen, airway protection, intubation if required, two large bow IV cannulas, fluids and bloods if required. In case of active bleeding, please remember hypertensive resuscitation, okay? Also, what is very important to realize is that when your patient is bleeding and if you give a lot of fluid to these patients, you dilute the coagulation factors. You dilute the platelets in the system and you get dilutional coagulopathy, okay? So it's very important when you give massive blood transfusion that you have to correct clotting. You have to keep them warm because hypothermia worsens your clotting. 
Again, anything which is going to worsen your clotting in a bleeding patient is going to result in more bleeding. So please keep that in mind. And usually with hypovolemic shock, you rarely require iron troops or vasopressors. You might require it just to buy some time so that if your blood's not arrived from the blood bank, you might just need to you know, keep uh, start a patient on a little bit of inotropes. Once the blood arrives, you can give the volume and you will find that you are able to get them off these vasopressors pretty quickly. Moving to the second types of shock, it's cardiac shock, cardiogenic shock. Now, cardiogenic shock, as I said, can occur because of two reasons. One is because of lack of contractility. This can occur following uh, MI, uh, LV aneurysm, in patients having arrhythmias, if you have fast AF or, or heart blocks, if there's a loss of uh, critical LV mass following an MI, okay, you have your RV pump failure as well as the cardiomyopathies. Now, obstructive kind of cardiogenic shock can be classified as uh, you know extracardiac and intracardiac. The intracardiac lesions are normally valvular lesions like severe uh, stenosis, okay, uh, septal perforation following uh, MI. Extracardiac causes are causes such as tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, or, or having a massive P. Pump failure. The pump failure usually is associated by with decreased contractility. Because the contractility is decreased, your body tries to compensate by increasing the systemic vascular resistance. Now, once that happens, your heart has to beat against resistance, and you already have a failing heart. So it tries to beat against the increased resistance and it starts failing even worse, okay? The other thing which can worsen your cardiac failure is increasing the work of your heart. And if your patient's hypoxic, then that can cause much more significant damage. And that's the reason why if you are suspecting anyone having cardiogenic shock, the first thing is to you know, put on oxygen. You have to give them very high amounts of oxygen, yeah? So treatment, as I said, is oxygen, opioids, okay? That is to decrease the pain in case your patient has had an MI because the pain is gonna drive the sympathetic system more. It's gonna cause tachycardic. It's gonna cause hypertension or increase in the peripheral vascular resistance. Diuretics, it to actually offload some fluids if your RV is dilated or if your LV is massively dilated. And as you all know, frusamide actually is a pulmonary vasodilator. So it starts vasodilating even before uh, your uh, fluid is offloaded from your heart. Vasodilators are very, very important, yeah? Using things like nitrates because they increase systemic vascular resistance is going to increase the work of your heart. So if I were given a choice of a single agent to use in severe cardiac failure, you know, vasodilators would be one of them. Inotropes, okay, the contractility is low, you increase contractility. How do you do that? You do that by using the inotropes. But which inotrope do you use? Now, this has been a issue which I don't think so anyone knows the answer to it at all, okay? So people have tried everything from, you know, dobutamine to phosphodiesterase inhibitors or inodilators, which are better, yeah? Uh, or people have used things like adrenaline in the past. Uh, people have used things like levosimentin, you know, endothelial agonists, uh, antagonists, and things like that. But what generally is agreed that any cyclic mediated, um, cyclic AMP mediated inotrope uh, probably has a much worse outcome than the others. For example, people might argue that having dobutamine or having uh, enoximon is probably worse than giving levosimendin. There are no studies which have shown this. Uh, I, I expect that in the five to 10 years from now, we will be slightly more wiser with this. Careful fluid bolusters. CPAP, in cardiogenic, uh, if your patient has cardiac failure and had gone into cardiogenic shock because of that, nothing works as beautifully as a CPAP mask. Just put it on your patient. What it does is increases the positive pressure in your lungs, decreases the amount of fluid which is coming into your lungs, so decreases your preload and makes your contractility better. We need a lot of patients who come to us with cardiac failure. All we have to do is put on a mask of CPAP and they feel you know, some relief within a matter of uh, you know, within an hour, they, they usually sort it. So it's a very useful intervention to have. You could, of course, use bridging treatments like, you know, uh, intraortic 
balloon pump or if you have a patient who's got severe cardiomyopathy if you have an lvad device you would use that but you know lvad devices are not normally recommended they are used only as a bridge to transplant so if you know that there is someone who's on a transplant list and will have a transplant in the next year or so these devices are useful otherwise there's no benefit in this device but of course if you find that there is a cause for your cardiogenic shock like an mi you could use thrombolysis and revascularization if you think it's cardiomyopathy which is very very severe i could use uh, heart transplantations at the same time if it's an obstructive cause you could always do things like pericardial drainage needle thoracotomy for uh, a pneumothorax or, or surgery for a, a left atrial myxoma now when I talk about vasopressors, I need to talk about this very interesting study. I've not put many studies here because I think it just confuses a lot of things. But this was a study which was done by uh, Levy and it was published in the American Journal of Cardiology in 2018, where they compared adrenaline versus noradrenaline in cardiogenic shock after myocardial infarction. And what they found out was that there was not much difference in the mean arterial pressures there was not much difference in the cardiac index. Of course, with adrenaline, there you expect a statistical difference when it comes to your heart rate. And there was not much difference in uh, the stroke volume index. But what they found a, a difference in was that there were a huge number of cases in the adrenaline group who had refractory shock as compared with the noradrenaline group. In the same study, they also showed that the arterial lactate following the use of adrenaline shot up massively, okay? And that was quite significant, statistically significant. The other statistical significance they found was in your cardiac uh, double product, which occurred with this. There was no mortality benefit which was seen because I think the p-value was not below 0 0.05 in this thing but they showed that adrenaline had a trend towards more mortality than noradrenaline. So keeping this in view, if you have a patient who has cardiogenic shock following uh, uh, a myocardial infarction and you've got two drugs, adrenaline or noradrenaline to use, uh, your choice of vasopressor should probably be noradrenaline and you can always add a little bit of dobutamine you know, for your inotropic effort. I'm not talk, going to talk much about septic shock because it's a whole topic by itself. But as we know, septic shock is a form of distributive shock. And patients, when they present with sepsis, initially they are very hypovolemic, okay? And you have to give them quite a lot of fluid because they lose quite a lot because of the permeability of capillary membranes has increased. So quite a lot of fluid start, is, is leaking out into the third space, or not third space, into the interstitium, okay? They have a wide pulse pressure due to vasodilatation. And to compensate that, you'll find that many of these patients have hyperdynamic circulation. A treatment of this, in, this is a very simplistic slide to treat sepsis, but uh, if you're asked in the exam, you know, again, oxygenation, airway ventilatory management, IV fluids to start with, vasopressors, broad spectrum antibiotic. As you know, after the Kumar study, you know, you have this golden hour of giving antibiotics and your mortality is decreased in patients in septic shock if you give them antibiotics within the first hour, okay? Of course, if you have a patient who's come with abdominal sepsis, source control is quite important, roaming the source, uh, and it is there in the uh, new sepsis 6 protocol too. Steroids, well, I mean, there is a big debate about the role of steroids. So the only time we use steroids in septic shock is when we see that they have an escalating dose of noradrenaline. So if the noradrenaline dose goes more than you know 0.3, that is 0.3 mics uh, per kg per minute, that, that's when we would actually advocate using steroids. Just a couple of slides on anaphylaxis, a kind of shock which occurs. It occurs because of hypersensitive and histamine release. It's a type of distributive shock. Can occur because of a reaction due to drugs, foods, insect stings. You know, it's summer here in the UK. We have a lot of wasps around, and and some people find, unfortunately, you know, they get stung by these insects and they can have severe anaphylactic shock. Now, what is the treatment? Oxygen. Okay, early threshold for intubation if you think that they're getting airway edema or anything of that sort. But if you, if someone were to ask you what is the only treatment for anaphylaxis, it is adrenaline. 
Yeah, there is nothing else which is a treat, which is the primary treatment of anaphylaxis. Either giving IM adrenaline in a dose of 0.5 milligrams, which is like half a mL of one in 1,000 ampule, give it IM, or IV adrenaline, which is like one in 10,000, if you give one mL of that. Ideally, you know, adrenaline, I mean, we are, um, you know, an anesthetic group. So all of us are skilled in giving IV adrenaline, so we could. But when we teach the other uh, students, we normally don't tell them to give IV adrenaline because IM adrenaline works as well as IV adrenaline, okay? IV fluids, because these patients are so vasodilated that we find that you normally need to give a liter to two liters of IV fluids in anaphylactic shock. Corticosteroids, H1, H2 receptor blockers, bronchodilators, and vasopressors are like secondary treatment. So in summary, uh, diagnosis and management of shock go hand in hand. Please do not forget your ABCs and oxygen. Treat the acute crisis. Determine what the cause of shock is. And based on that, do a definitive management. Okay, thank you. That's me done. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them.